deal with an insane world, that doctors are not necessarily more normal than patients. Needless to say, not all doctors agree. With us on Signature, Scottish-born psychiatrist R.D. Lang. Is there a phrase or a single word or an experience that you think is the best way for us to begin to look at your position? If, if I can take a single word, uh, I would uh, prefer to call it suffering. Suffering and confusion, misery, consternation, bewilderment. Consternation, bewilderment, dreadful, hellish states of mind that people get into. So they're so paralyzed by their fear. Uh, people are afraid more than anything else, I would say, of other people. Children and other people sometimes get on the other side of being socialized and so on. They become frightened not of cats and dogs or of the sky falling down or falling through there. They become frightened of other people. They become frightened of human beings. Now, if you're frightened of a human being, you, you, you cringe. Now, if, if I start to be frightened of you and start to cringe, and if I become so frightened of you, I feel that really it's terrifying to say anything to you, then I'm, I, I'm cringing, I, I can't make a move in relationship to you, and I can't say anything. So from a psychiatric point of view, I'm suddenly a mute, catatonic, schizophrenic. So I, I get a guy coming in to see me, and he stands in front of me, and he, he's absolutely, he can't move, and he can't say anything. Now, from a psychiatric point of view, I can sort of write, you are a catatonic schizophrenic and you need, need electric shocks. From a human point of view, you are a guy like me who, for reasons that I don't know, but I can maybe stretch my mind and imagine, I've got frightened of other people. And you're so frightened of other people. You haven't met me, but you, you know, um, you, you, you're just standing there. Now, so this is a guy who is frozen with terror. Now, if a guy comes to meet me who's, uh, who's looking for my help and I realize he's frozen with terror, what I do is I behave intuitively as one human being to another in such a way that he might, um, from the way I conduct myself in the first place, not have any reason to be frightened of me because I'm you know, I tell him, you know, I can see that you're absolutely terrified of me. You know, I've never met you. I, I want you to know that right? you don't have to believe me. But I'm just telling you anyway. I've got no designs on you. I'm not going to uh, put drugs into you you don't want. I'm not going to assault you. I'm not going to lock you up. I'm not going to give you ele electricity and so on, etc. Brother, you're frightened of me and I'm not frightened of you. Want an adjustable bed, but don't think you can afford Where you differ with the, a big part of the psychiatric community is the way that we treat this person once they are so frightened. You're saying, if I hear you right, that the shocks and the drugs and the conventional psychiatric tell me your problems. What? Uh, Make them frightened more. I mean, this guy that we've got in front of uh, me is not asking for drugs, uh, or he might be. I mean, he might say, I'm so terrified, you know, please give me something to, just to calm me down. I'll give him an image of it. You know, what can I do for you? Uh, and you're so frightened. Well, he does, he's frightened of the treatment he's going to get. He's frightened of... Uh, electricity on his brain because he's frightened. And then he's called paranoid because he's frightened of what's going to be done to him and he's perfectly right. So you're saying the conventional treatment, shock, drugs, whatever, is not going to help this terrified man and is it true that you feel that if you allow the course of this insanity just to run its course, 
that the person will come out well? Not <coughs> no, not necessarily. Um, I've been quoted in that sense uh, a lot, which comes out of a few paragraphs or, or of the politics of experience in particular. And I, I think that it's definitely true that uh, some people, uh, you might say, blow it. They go over the hill, you know. Well, they go over the hill. They go into the wilderness. They lose their bearings and lose their way. They become completely disorientated. They don't know who they are. They don't know whether it's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, I've been in a certain amount of that territory myself. Uh, without being labelled insane. Uh, and I can sometimes, sometimes, uh, when a, you know someone has gone over the hill and got lost over there, I can sometimes go out if I, if I want to take the trouble to do so and go out and uh, hunt for that person and find them where they've got to and meet them there and say, do you want to come back? Well, let me ask you, what if the drugs do work, if they do calm a person down and allow them to re-enter society, as we know lithium, the number of drug treatments do, if shock therapy does take a person out of deep depression, if mental institutions are a place for families to put frighteningly disturbed people, what's wrong with that? I don't think there's anything wrong with all that. Um, as far as you've said it. If someone prefers acid to electric shocks to get them out of their depression, as far as I'm concerned, fine. Let it be even. But in this world, it's, it's not even. If you're depressed, you can only have electric shocks. I'm not allowed to prescribe people acid. I'm only allowed to prescribe the electric shocks. Now, I would like to be able to prescribe acid or electric shocks if someone wants electric shocks. But as I understand you, you prefer neither your form of treatment. You say the doctor and the patient in your commune... That We're you on the with. same side. But yet the very premise of medicine is that the doctor knows what's going on and is going to oversee our getting well. That's the premise of technological medicine nowadays. It's not the basic pres uh, uh, premise of Hippocratic medicine that uh, medicine comes out of or uh, still less uh, what you might call Aesculapian medicine. And, and how do you uh, think Western, a doctor... Uh, uh, well, the, the thing is you ask yourself uh, what is this disturbance on a boat? What is the um, uh, biofeedback, what is the, uh, what is the um, cybernetic relationship of this disturbance in one person to the system that they're in. And you provide yourself with a larger context to, under to try to understand uh, what is going on. For instance, if someone's got asthma, all right, that means that they can't breathe out basically. You can take a breath in, but you're, you're uh, breath out. Now, why is someone you ask that question within the context of the thing. You, you can give someone drugs. I mean, I've suffered from asthma for years. I haven't suffered from asthma for the last 15 years or so. But I, I, I would take cortisone uh, derivatives and uh, anything else to uh, uh, release my breath. At the same time, I would like to ask myself, why am I not breathing freely? Why, uh, why can't I breathe freely? Well, if it becomes clearer to me why I can't breathe freely, or I'm not breathing freely, wh why I feel suffocated and I'm dramatizing that, then I have got another route out of this um, asphyxiation. Now, I don't see it as a either or, but a both and. See, I'm not condemning the use of any drug, whatever, from aspirin to lithium uh, to uh, any sort of tranquilizer or even electric shocks. But I'm saying that there are basically two things that um, 
mess that up uh, these days. One is that the doctor's got an idea that he knows best, though he knows nothing, actually, the, uh, about this person. And uh, there's a whole generation of psychiatrists... But, but that's very easy to say. Wait a minute. The doctor's been trained for years and years and years. Mm. He may not know John Jones personally, mm. but he may be very well of the symptoms which are common to a particular illness. Uh, how does he know any illness or uh, anyone personally if he uh, arrests the course of the illness or whatever is happening uh, within... Uh, uh, for instance, there's been a study in America which has uh, uh, shown on the average uh, doctors diagnose someone psychotic within three minutes. Now, uh, I went round uh, uh, America several times in the last uh, 12 years or so, and I've been repeatedly asked to do interviews uh, with patients in front of um, sort of master classes, you might say, in front of psychiatrists at Yale and Harvard and... Um, Illinois and Chicago and the West Coast and so on, etc. I, I, I said I would do this if they produced a non-tranquilized or non-drugged treated patient who could speak to me and so on. Um, not once uh, did they ever produce someone like that. Because as soon as someone is even seen for three minutes or ten minutes or twenty minutes by a psychiatrist in the first place, and diagnosed as psychotic, that diagnosis is a tautology, uh, uh, or it's equivalent to saying that person needs to have their state of mind stopped right away by drugs or electricity, otherwise it'll get worse. And your point is, let it go and... Well, my point is that psychiatrists don't know what they're talking about because they don't know anything after what happens when they uh, administer the prescription. Can, can we so, so just, they just don't know anything can about... Can we pause for an uh, example? Someone. If you, if necessary, make one up. John Jones comes to the office of a regular psychiatrist, diagnosed as psychotic, given drugs to interrupt that process. Same John Jones comes to you. Mm. You don't give them drugs. What do you want that John Jones to do? Well, I recognize he's deeply confused probably. Um, uh, his sense of reality is definitely different from mine. Uh, he, he, he may um, um, believe uh, all sorts of things that I don't. He may even see things that I don't and hear th voices that I don't and uh, etc. Et etc. Et um, and uh, he, uh, now we've got two situations here. Uh, let's take, from my point of view, the simpler issue, that this guy actually wants me to help him. Well, I might say it's a nice day, let's go out for a walk. This is the guy who thinks he's Napoleon now. Yeah, well, let's go out for a walk. And Let's, it's a nice day, let's, um, let's, you know, just talk about, or, or not talk about this, let's um, consider the situation. Uh, I offer him what's available of me for human companionship, camaraderie, possibility of um, considering this situation. Um, I'm not offering him friendship because I might not like this guy. I'm not offering him unlimited time on my part and commitment on my life. I'm, I'm offering him in the first place, um, because he's, he, I mean, he may think he's Napoleon, but absolutely no one else does. Uh, actually, I haven't met anyone who thought he was Napoleon for years and years and years and years and years and years. And years. Some people who think... There was one guy who came to see me from Germany who, who declared he was Jesus Christ. Uh, so I, I said to him, well... In effect, prison, you said, you ain't Jesus. Um, in effect, 
in effect, but it was a bit more than that. I was a bit annoyed, you know. I'm pressed in my life. I, I've got my problems too, and this guy's coming to me and saying, Jesus Christ, and he's, he's also saying,